In alhamdulillah, nahmaluhu wa nasta'inuhu wa nasta'afiruhu wa natubu ilayhi wa na'udhu billahi min shiruri anfusina wa min sayati a'malina man yahdihi allahu falamubilla lah wa man yuddil falahadiya lah wa ashadu an la ilaha illa allahu wahduhu la sharika lah wa ashadu anna muhammadan abduhu wa rasuluhu sallallahu alayhi wa sallam First of all, my dearest sisters, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Ask Allah Ta'ala that you're all in the highest state of iman and health, bi'idhnillahi ta'ala. And I firstly just like to say jazakunnallahu khairan to ICMG for organizing tonight. And may they get the reward for everyone whose iman is uplifted in this night, bi'idhnillahi ta'ala. And it's so important for us to come together and reflect upon the true role models of this ummah. Because especially in this time of social media, you know, it's, it's hard to see who are the, you know, subhanAllah, our, the true role, role models of our ummah, they are like lights for this ummah. So it's important for us to familiarize ourselves with their stories and their legacies. So first of all, my dear sisters, the wife of the Prophet that I have chosen to speak about tonight is Umm al-Mu'mineen, Umm Habiba, radiyallahu anha wa ardaha. And one of the reasons I chose to speak about her is because her story is filled with lots of trials and tribulations. And you see how she held on to her faith and had what's called al-istiqama, which means staying steadfast despite whatever she went through. And this is something we all need to try to adopt, especially in this time, right? So Umm Habiba radiallahu anha, her real name was Ramla, the daughter of Abi Sufyan. And she was called after her daughter, like she was, her, that's her kunya, like Umm Habiba. She's called after her daughter Habiba, whom she gave birth to, to her first husband. Now from her distinctions, is that when she was from the very first of those to embrace Islam, Right? And she also made not one, but two hijras for the sake of Allah. So two migrations for the sake of Allah Azza wa Now from all of the wives of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, she was also the most closely related to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in her blood lineage through both her father and her mother. And in fact, she was a cousin to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam through her father. And also, as we'll see, Allah Ta'ala actually sent down verses concerning her marriage to the Prophet وسلم, to be recited until Yom Qiyamah. Her father was Abu Sufyan, who before becoming a Muslim was one of the most powerful leaders of Quraysh. Her brother was Muawiyah, who later, as many of you may know, became from the Khulafa of the Islamic Empire. And her mother was actually the maternal aunt of Uthman ibn Affan, radiallahu anhu. As for her virtues, she was a woman who held tightly onto her deen. And she kept herself steadfast on the path of Allah, despite the many trials and tribulations that she went through in her life. She was born about 10 years before the revelation of the Prophet you know, came down to him before the, the, the revelation of Allah came down to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And it was in fact said that she was born 17 years before that. She was described as being tall in stature, wise in her thinking, humble in her character and beautiful in her appearance. She married young and her first husband's name was Ubaidullah bin Jash. And no sooner did the news reached their household about the call of the Prophet وسلم, to Tawheed and the oneness of Allah Azza wa except Umm Habiba and her husband Ubaidullah embraced Al-Islam. Now as we know, in the early days of Mecca, the disbelievers used to persecute and even torture anyone who was found to be Muslim. So you can only just imagine what was the reaction of the father of Umm Habiba, Abu Sufyan, who was at that time, as we said, from the most prominent leaders of Quraysh. And imagine his reaction when he found out that his own daughter has accepted Al-Islam. And that's why he began to persecute her in many different ways. 
just as the mushrikeen were persecuting the believers at that time. But sisters, subhanAllah, despite whatever she went through, we see how she remained steadfast upon her deen, along with her husband in those very early days of Al-Islam. And one of the lessons that we need to remind ourselves of always in reflecting upon that is remind yourself that, um, and it's something that Allah also teaches us in the Quran, that don't think it's enough to say amanna. Don't think it's enough just to say I believe with your tongue and that Allah Ta'ala is not gonna test you to see the sincerity of your faith. As Allah Ta'ala in the Quran says, Do people think that they'll be left just to say that we believe and they would not be tested to see the sincerity of their Iman? And as anyone here knows, if you happen to be a revert, especially one of the hardest things that you can go through when you choose Al-Islam is to have your own family turn against you. But what we see from Umm Habiba radiallahu anha is how she had tasted the halawat al-iman. She had tasted the sweetness of al-iman. And that's why she did not hesitate in leaving her homeland and making hijra to al-habasha, to Ethiopia, with her husband, out of protecting her deen and answering, answering the call of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam. And it was said that she was even pregnant with her daughter Habiba at that time when she made hijra. Now in fact, Umm Habiba ended up staying in that foreign land of Al-Habasha for at least 15 years without returning. Now what happened was, this is from the trials of Umm Habiba, subhanAllah, in the sixth year, after the Prophet ﷺ had made hijra to Al Medina, Umm Habiba saw a dream one night that greatly disturbed her. Because in that dream, she saw the husband that she loved in the worst of forms. And it was a form showing her disobedience, disobedience to Allah. And it was as if it wasn't her husband that she loved. And then what happened was the next morning when she woke up, she found her husband coming to her and saying to her, Um Habiba, I have thought about religion and I did not think that there's any better religion than Christianity. So I have gone back to my former faith. And no doubt he wanted Um Habiba to follow him in that you know, apostasy, right? And imagine that, you can imagine the trial of that for her because she's living in that foreign land away from her family, a family, you know, they've all rejected her and, and exiled her out of her land. And she's living in that land of the Christians. And now her husband has apostatized, to, you know, um, from Islam. So Umm Habiba uh, told him, Wallahi, you will have no khayr. There'll be no goodness in what you're doing. And verily this night, I saw a dream. Like Allah showed me a dream of you in the worst of forms. So she was trying to warn him, be careful. You're treading a very dangerous path. And in one narration, Um Habiba says that, you know, I tried to tell him about that dream, you know, in order to warn him, but, you know, he didn't pay attention and he ended up, well, the Bilal sisters, he ended up becoming addicted to alcohol until he died upon kufr. He died upon disbelief to Allah and addicted to alcohol. So he, he died in the worst of states, right? He died upon su'il khatima, the, the, the bad ending. May protect us from that. So no doubt, one of the hardest tests for a woman in particular is to be tested with a husband whom she loves and then suddenly he leaves Islam and begins to follow a path of clear-cut masiyah, clear-cut you know, disobedience to Allah Azza wa And this is why the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam taught us لا طاعة لمخلوق في معصية الخالق There's no obedience to the creation in the disobedience of Allah. And that we need to realize also that, you know, this journey that we are on in this life, realize that Allah Ta'ala is going to test us sometimes with the people or the things that we love the most. To see who do we love more. Allah is going to test you to see who do you love more. Is it Allah and the Akhirah or is it that individual and the dunya? 
may not protect us. You know, even if that person was your husband or your parent or your child, Allah could choose you to test you in that person. So sisters, this is how Umm Habiba refused to follow her husband in his kufr. And instead, she turned to Allah, Allah Azza wa She increased in her ibadah, in her worship of Allah, and kept on making dua to, you know, to Allah to keep her steadfast. And subhanAllah, my dear sisters, not long after that, she saw another dream in which someone was calling to her and saying, Ya Umm al-Mu'mineen, O mother of the believers. Now, as you know, that's only the title for the wives of the Prophet wasallam. So instead of them calling her Umm Habiba in the dream, they're calling her Umm al-Mu'mineen. And subhanAllah, Umm um Habiba says that no sooner did she wake up from that dream, but she found the messenger of the king in Al-Habasha coming to her with the news that the Prophet ﷺ has sent a letter to the king to inform her that the Prophet ﷺ is proposing to her. Because as we said, the Prophet ﷺ is Medina, right? He's already made hijrah to a Medina. And the news has come to him about the apostasy of Ubaidullah and the istiqamah and the steadfastness of, of Umm Habiba upon her iman. So Umm Habiba tells us how that moment when she heard that news, she took off her silver jewelry out of happiness and gave it to that messenger of the king. And, you know, subhanAllah, one of the things um, this also shows you is how when someone is close to Allah in their iman, like you really have that closeness to Allah, Allah can actually send you dreams. Allah can actually send you dreams in order to strengthen you and help you to stay steadfast upon your iman in times of trials and tribulations. And the Messenger of Allah told us that this is the good dream that Allah sends to the believer is one part from the 46 parts of prophecy or prophethood. And one of the lessons that we can also take from this is that no matter how dark, dark life gets, but as long as you're with Allah, there's always a way out. There's always a way out, right? As long as you're with Allah. And as long as you're with Allah Ta'ala, you'll never be a loser. And that's why we should never despair of the rahmah and the mercy of Allah and know that the relief of the hardship is always near. As Allah Ta'ala says in the Quran, Inna rahmatullahi min al That verily, the mercy of Allah is near al muhsinin those who do righteousness. And Allah Ta'ala also tells us, Whoever has taqwa of Allah, Allah will find a way out for them. And Allah Ta'ala will bless them in ways they could never have imagined. وَمَنْ يَتَوَكَّلْ عَلَى اللَّهِ فَهُوَ حَسْبُ Whoever has tawakkul in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then Allah is sufficient for that person. So my dear sisters, this is how Umm Habiba became Umm al-Mu'mineen and the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam married her while she was still in al-Habasha and he was in al-Madina. And in fact, it was the king who was known as al-Najashi who was the one who conducted her marriage on behalf of the Prophet ﷺ. And one of her relatives, Khalid bin Sa'id al-As, was her wali. And sister, subhanAllah, at that time, Umm Habiba was already about 36 or 37 years of age. And of course, she also had her daughter with her, Habiba. And one of the things this also shows you is how the Prophet ﷺ did not marry women merely due to his desires, with no purpose for the sake of Allah. Like as we know, the true mu'min, just the normal mu'min, lives their life with purpose. So how much more do you think the Messenger of Allah, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Sayyid al-Mu'mineen, the leader of the mu'mineen, was living his life with purpose? He doesn't do anything except there's a huge purpose behind it, right? And so from the wisdoms of him marrying Umm Habiba was firstly out of making it up for her for the many trials that she had gone through. She's 
it was evident that she was a very sincere believer. Like from the first to embrace Islam and from the first to make Hijra, right? She had a lot of she had a lot of righteousness, right? And to reward her for her steadfastness, especially after the apostasy of her husband in Al Habasha, in that lonely land, right? Also from the wisdoms of him marrying her was it was a means towards softening the hearts of Bani Umayya, who were from the, the severest opponents from Quraysh, like they were one of the clans of Quraysh, right? And Abu Sufyan, her father, was the leader of, you know, he was the prominent leader from Bani Umayya from amongst Quraysh. And it was due to the blessing of the marriage of Umm Habiba to the Prophet wasallam, that Allah Ta'ala even sent down verses in Sunnah Muntahina, Allah Ta'ala says, بَعْدَ أَعُوذُ بِاللَّهِ مِنَ الشَّيْطَانِ الرَّجِيمِ عَسَى اللَّهُ أَنْ يَجْعَلَ بَيْنَكُمْ وَبَيْنَ الَّذِينَ عَادَيْتُمْ وَبَيْنَ الَّذِينَ عَادَيْتُمْ مِنْهُمْ مَوَدَّهُ وَاللَّهُ قَدِيرٌ وَاللَّهُ غَفُورٌ رَّحِيمٌ so Allah Ta'ala says in these verses, it may be that Allah will place affection between those who have enmity with, with you, with whom you have enmity with. Wallahu Qadir, Allah is the most able. Wallahu Ghafur Rahim, Allah is the most forgiving and merciful, right? And Ibn Abbas radiallahu anhu says about this ayah that the mawadda that Allah mentions in this ayah, the affection, is that, um, that Allah Ta'ala placed affection between the believers and their enemies from Quraysh through the marriage of Umm Habiba to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, right? And of course, as we said, she's the daughter of Abi Sufyan. And subhanAllah, dear sisters, it wasn't too many years after this that both Umm Habiba, both Umm Habiba's father, Abu, Su- Abu Sufyan, and her brother Muawiyah, ended up embracing Islam. And as we know, they became from even the leaders from amongst, you know, from amongst the Muslims. They became prominent, subhanAllah, in Islam and had lots of righteous deeds after that, subhanAllah. And so this is one of the examples that shows you how Allah is Al-Qadir. As you know, one of the beautiful names of Allah is Al-Qadir, right? He's able to do all things. We have to believe in that. Allah is Al-Qadir. He's able to do all things without exception. And this is why you need to realize that many times Allah Ta'ala is going to cause certain things to happen in your life in order to push you into a path that Allah wants for you. So realize everything is from the plan of Allah. Like nothing's happening there with no purpose and no meaning, right? So my dear sisters, after that, Umm Habiba set off to Al-Madinah to be with her husband, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And so this is how she became from amongst the very few believers who gained the reward of two hijras, two migrations for the sake of Allah. The first to al Habasha, to Ethiopia, and the second to al Medina. While the majority of the companions had the reward for one migration only for the sake of Allah Ta'ala to al Medina. And so it was at the beginning of the seventh year of the hijra when Umm Habiba, radiallahu anha, and the companions who had made hijrah to Al-Medina, began to arrive in Al-Medina. And at that time, the Prophet ﷺ was distributing the booty from Al-Khaybah. And the Prophet ﷺ had arranged for Umm Habiba to be next door to the house of Umm Salama. Because Umm Salama had originally made hijrah to Al-Habasha. And so she and Umm Habiba had become friends in Al-Habasha. And they had spent time together in that foreign land. And so subhanAllah sisters, this is how, imagine after all these years, Allah Ta'ala willed for them to be brought back together. But at this time, it was united in the city of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, in the household of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and both as co-wives, co-wives to the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. SubhanAllah, look at the honour. And sisters, from the moment that Umm Habiba arrived, in the household of the Prophet ﷺ, she focused her attention on trying to gain as much knowledge as she could. 
due to what she felt she had missed out on all those years. Like she was, you know, there in Al Habasha, away from the Prophet, away from the community of the believers in Al Medina. And no doubt there would have been so much knowledge that she hadn't heard of before, right? And sisters, even though she only spent four years with the Prophet before he passed away, in that short amount of time, she managed to preserve for the Ummah of Al-Islam more than 65 hadith of the Prophet Two of those hadiths are from those which are agreed upon by both Imam al-Bukhari and Muslim, meaning they reach the highest level of authenticity from hadiths. And another two are reported by Ali Imam, Muslim only, and the rest are found in the various books of hadith. And so this is how Umm Habiba, in fact, ended up becoming, from amongst the prominent female narrators and memorizers of hadith, despite the very short time she had been able to spend with the Prophet And from amongst those who transmitted hadiths from Umm Habiba were her brothers Muawiyah, and Ambasa, and also, subhanAllah, Zainab bint Abi Salama, who's the daughter of Umm Salama, her close friend, right? SubhanAllah, and many others too. From her hadiths is one narrated in the Sunan of Abi Dawood that Umm Habib narrates that the Prophet said, Men salla ithnatay asharata raka'a fi yawmin wal layla buniya lahu bihinna baytun fil jannah that whoever prayed 12 extra rakah in a day and night, Allah Ta'ala will build for them a house in a jannah. And look at what Umm Habiba says about this, this hadith. She said, فَمَا تَوَقْتُهُنَّ مُنْذُ سَمِعْتُهُنَّ مِنْ رَسُولِ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَمْ I did not leave them from the time I heard that from the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم. And this shows you, may Allah forgive us, the difference between us and how the Sahaba used to be. You know, they would just take that few hadiths from the Messenger of Allah, but you'd find them implementing it. They would read a few ayats of the Quran and you'd find them implementing it. You know, they'd rush to implement it. You know, subhanAllah, may Allah forgive us all, inshallah, keep us steadfast. From her narrations also is that whoever prayed for rakah before dhuhr and for after dhuhr, the fire will be forbidden for them. Also for her, her narrations um, that she mentioned that's recorded by Ali Imam Muslim that the Prophet وسلم, said that it's not allowed for the woman who believes in Allah and the next life to mourn for anyone who's deceased more than three days. Like what that means is to you know, give up um, you know, wearing perfume and give up wearing like bright clothes, you know, and to show that you're mourning for someone. You know what I'm trying to say? Not that you can't still be sad after they've passed away after three days, but just that you, you can't show um, by what you wear, you know, wearing plain clothes and all that, that you're mourning for more than three days, unless it's for the husband who it's legislated to mourn for the husband for four months and ten days, the husband who passed away, of course. So this is how the Umm Habiba came to play a prominent role in preserving the teachings of the Sharia for us. So this is, this is how Allah Ta'ala made it up for Umm Habiba after she had gone through so many trials in her life. Firstly, all of the persecutions and hardships that she went through in the early days of Islam and having to leave her homeland and to migrate for the sake of Allah. And then the trials that she went through all of the years she lived in Al Habasha in Ethiopia you know, the loneliness, the isolation, and also the fitna of her first husband apostatizing and turning to alcohol and then dying on kufr. So my dear sisters, those four years passed so fast until Allah Ta'ala chose to test Umm Habiba one more time with the loss of the Prophet wasallam, after she had spent such a short time with him. And we can only imagine the sadness that she would have felt, and you know, you can just imagine the sadness that all of Al Medina felt, right? And all of the Mu'minin. And so, Umm Habiba, radiallahu anha, she lived on through the time of the Khilafah of Abu Bakr, radiallahu anhu, and Umar, radiallahu anhu, and Uthman. 
And she used to rarely leave her house unless it was for a very pressing need after the passing of the Prophet ﷺ. But during the Khilafah of Uthman, due to fitna, due to some fitna that occurred, some people had placed Uthman ibn Affan under a siege in his house. And as we remember, I told you in the beginning that she, you know, he was the son of her maternal aunt. So he, you know, he's, he's from her blood relatives, right? So Umm Habiba, she came out to the house of Uthman in her haldaj. A haldaj is like a carriage that the, the um, Ummahat al Mu'minin, like the wives of the believers, sorry, the, the mothers of the believers, used to go when they would go out of their houses. They would sit inside a carriage, for example, on top of a, on top of a camel, for example, right? And it's like it's like it's contained. They're inside. The reason that she did that is because. She wanted the people to, to you know, see her presence there and feel shy of themselves and say, this is Umm al-Mu'mineen, the wife of the Messenger of Allah, and they, even she's coming out of her house for this, this great you know, travesty that's coming in the Ummah of Fitna to the Khalifa you know, the, you know, the, um, the khalif of the Muslims, right? So they may stop that siege against the Khalifa of the Muslims, right? Who's Uthman. So what happened was that one of the men, well, one of the men who were involved in that siege, he came and looked inside the carriage of Umm Habiba, and he began describing what she looked like to the people. And so Umm Habiba made dua against him, and said, "Qata Allahu yadahu wa abda awratahu." May his what he should say first of all, what is with him to do some such a thing, right? May his hand be cut off and may Allah expose his awra. Why? Because he is stealing. Like, you know, <laughs> he is stealing from the privacy of the wife of the Prophet وسلم, Umm al-Mu'mineen, Umm Habiba radiallahu anha wa abdaha. And then he's exposing that to the people. So then one of the supporters of the Khalifa, Uthman, came. And subhanAllah, he came and just struck that man with his sword which happened to land on his right hand and caused it to get chopped off, subhanAllah. And so that man started running and he was holding his, like his uh, waistcoat with his left hand and due to that, subhanAllah, you won't believe it, his awra became exposed. So this is how Allah Ta'ala responded to the dua of Umm al-Mu'mineen, Umm Habiba, radiallahu anha wa baha, due to that man transgressing upon her honour and her privacy. And so this shows you why people need to be especially careful in what they say and how they speak, especially when it comes to the wives of the Prophet ﷺ. And it also shows you, my dear sisters, how Allah defends and protects his awliya from amongst the believing men and women. As is mentioned in authentic hadith read by Ibn Abbas, radiallahu anhu, that the Prophet said, Guard the rights of Allah, you'll find Allah will be guarding and protecting you. Guard the rights of Allah, you'll find Him in front of you, defending you, subhanAllah, and, and, you know, and supporting you and protecting you. Another thing this incident also shows you too, my dear sisters, is the strength of the righteous believing women of the past. They weren't weak and passive. Rather, they were empowered due to their sincere iman in Allah, tabarakah ta'ala, right? And their strong connection to the source of all quwa, right? All izzah, all honor is with Allah. All strength is with al qawi al aziz. So, my dear sisters, Umm Habiba, radiallahu anha, lived on until the khilafah of her brother Muawiyah. Ibn Abi Sufyan, and even during the time of the fitna that broke out between Ali and Muawiyah, she never took part in any of that, despite it was her brother who was involved. Then the year of the 40, it was 44 after the Hijra, 44 years after the Hijra came, and Umm Habiba fell sick after she returned back from Damascus after visiting her brother Muawiyah, and she felt that her life is coming to an end, as is related by Al-Imam Ahmed. And so she called for Aisha, radiallahu anha, 
And she said to Aisha, Yeah, Aisha, verily there was between me and you that which, be, which comes between co-wives. So may Allah forgive me and you from whatever was that, from that. And so Aisha radiallahu anha said to her, May Allah forgive you for any of that and overlook anything. And so then Umm Habiba said to her, Sarrabtani sarrakallah. So she said to me, Ya Aisha, you have made me so happy. So may Allah make you happy like you've made me happy. You've relieved that burden from me. I just want to leave this life with the qalbun salim, with the clean heart, free from you know, any bad feelings towards anyone. And so that I leave this life and I don't have any wrong that I feel I might have done to someone. SubhanAllah. Right? And then she called for Umm Salama and she said the same thing that she said to Aisha. So SubhanAllah, something we can learn from this incident as well is look at the true sisterhood they were able to achieve despite being co-wives. Like it was, it's not easy being a co-wife. It's probably like one of the hardest things for a woman to do, you know, like... Um, as you know, one of the hardest tests for most women is keeping their hearts free from feelings of jealousy and, you know, and hatred and bad feelings towards others. So what if that woman's your co-wife? You know? So they, did have, they, weren't, you know, they weren't perfect. They did have little you know, incidents between them, you know what I'm trying to say? But they had the taqwa of Allah that there was restraint. It didn't go overboard like what you would find in this day and age, you know, between what happens between many sisters, the way they have fights and stuff like that, right? So this is how she died after asking the wives for forgiveness and so that she could meet her Lord in a state of being radiyatan marbiya, right? In a state of her being pleased with Allah and Allah being pleased with her. As Allah Ta'ala says in Surah Fajr, Ya ayyatuhan nafsul mutma'inna ارجعي الى ربك راضيه مرضيه فادخلي في عبادي وادخلي جنتي O oh my tranquil soul return back to your lord pleased with Allah and Allah is pleased with you فادخلي في عبادي enter into my as and join my servants Wadahuli Jannati, enter into my Jannah. SubhanAllah, the place where no more sadness, no more pain, no more, nothing to upset you in the least. I ask Allah Ta'ala to gather us all in the next life with our beloved Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and all of his wives and to allow us to be from those who drink from his hold, from his water tank which its water is whiter than milk and it's sweeter than honey and its vessels are more numerous than the stars in the sky. And I ask Allah Ta'ala to make us from those who will walk with the Prophet وسلم, and follow him into Al-Jannah with the Prophets and the Siddiqeen, the sincere believers and the Shuhada and Salihin, the martyrs and the righteous. I ask Allah Ta'ala to make us from those who will meet with Allah, having the qalbun salim, the clean heart, the pure heart from having any diseases of the heart in it, and the state in which we are from those who we are pleased with Allah as our Lord, and with our Prophet as our, you know, as our messenger, and with our, you know, pleased with Islam as our deen, and may Allah Ta'ala Make us from those whom he is pleased when we meet with him. وأقول قولي هذا وأستغفر الله ولي ولكم وسبحانك اللهم وبحمدك نشهد ولا إله إلا أنت نستغفرك ونتوب إليك السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته.